You heard I was doing good out there. I was not selling drugs. I was doing none of that. I would say you are feeding the addiction that they're battling with, and, you're, and you are profiting. How do drug lords react when they're finally caught and brought into courtrooms to face justice? We've brought some cases from the courtroom to show you firsthand. Our list starts off, Lord of a fear-inspired. The Columbus Police Narcotics had received multiple reports about a trafficking ring working with a Mexican cartel. The leader, 48-year-old Jose Govea Jimenez, was under extensive investigation until finally he was caught by the police officers. In the investigation, the cops had uncovered some horrifying truths. Jimenez had been smuggling into Columbus for more than 10 years. That's not all. It was further disclosed that he had been the one responsible for bringing in 100 kilograms inside the city each month. That's millions worth of trade. After the arrest and interrogation, around 25 kilograms and 11 firearms were discovered that allegedly had a direct association with Jimenez. As Jimenez is ushered into the courtroom for further proceedings, one cannot help but observe his demeanor, a demanding and unthreatened presence that speaks for itself, an utter contempt towards the investigators. His hardened look is targeted towards the prosecutors and witnesses section, and there are no signs of guilt or shame on his face whatsoever. After being seated, the prosecutor begins his sentencing for the convicted Jimenez. It is clear from the sentence the authority Jimenez has in the city and the fear he has produced because of his cartel. A witness later reveals that her house was being used as a drop-off site. Every time, the drop-off would be one to two kilos. She would pay $9,000 to buy the and stash and make around $14,500 over it. For the sake of her security and her potential threats by the Mexican cartel, the witness's identification remains hidden. The footage shows Jimenez listening intently to the statement with a blank impression on his face. He does not appear to be affected in any way whatsoever by whatever is going on around him, holding his head slightly higher, almost in a questioning manner. It's likely that he couldn't believe that there was someone who could dare to stand against him as a witness. Luckily, the identity of the victim was kept anonymous. As Jimenez delivers a rehearsed apology to the court, the judge scrutinizes it closely. However, despite Jimenez's fully-fledged attempts to downplay his actions in Columbus, they didn't work. As, unfortunately for him, the witness's statement dashed any hopes he had of receiving a reduced sentence, along with the other evidence collected against him. The judge ordered him to 21 years in prison. After serving the prison sentence, he will be deported, having no hopes of staying in Columbus. Jimenez was charged with one count of engaging in corrupt activity and two counts of trafficking. Jimenez is seen leaving the court with a scornful expression on his face and possible disbelief in his statement. The next case is of a dealer who went just as big and remained unbothered by the whole fiasco unrolling before him. In March 2020, an investigation by the Houston County Department found a crucial piece of information regarding a from another investigation. A shipment of around 87 pounds that was worth approximately $4 million was seized by the authorities. Apart from the $284,600 in cash was found, suggesting a huge purchase that must have happened recently. However, the evidence suggested that the connection was with a 53-year-old man named Dexter Lee Williams. He was later identified as the ringleader of an extensive dealing operation also more often than not regarded as kingpin. His defense argued that Williams only carried out a single deal in Georgia with a Macon man. However, the prosecution wanted to bring in a larger sentence for Williams, so they retorted back by explaining his deep connections and his past history 
as a known dealer. Williams was imprisoned in the year 2007 for marijuana distribution. He was in jail for 37 months, but then he decided to go even bigger this time around, which was clearly described by the defense. The investigation further disclosed that Williams was importing a crazy amount from the Gulf Cartel in Mexico and then distributing it in the United States. The known targets for Williams were the middle of Georgia, but Atlanta and other northern parts of Georgia were also part of distribution. There were over 25,000 calls and messages where deals were being arranged, and most of them had Williams' voice recorded in the transactions. The defense suspected that the deals had been going on for five years, and they planned to expand to different parts of the country. The prosecution also described Williams' intention of distributing other narcotics. Even after the arrest, Williams showed disbelief at being caught, but no sense of remorse or guilt. The court recognized his intentions as well, which is why the judge's sentence for Williams is harsh enough. Despite this, Williams's body language reveals indifference, as if the sentence doesn't affect him. However, he pretends to listen to the judge, perhaps in a bid for a reduced sentence. Williams's lawyer, on the other hand, appears visibly frustrated, sighing as she leans back in her chair. Dismissing the judge's words, she seems intent on conveying this sentiment to Williams, who remains unfazed by the unfolding events. The lawyer resorted to drinking water from the bottle to compose herself, yet it wasn't long before anger overtook her. As seen in the footage, she assumed a defensive stance in court, seeming to make the case about herself. Without even fully hearing her client William's statement, she abruptly fled the courtroom in distress. In contrast, Williams remained seated, his expression blank as he listened to the judge's sentencing. He had been charged with three counts of racketeering and sentenced to 40 years in prison. Despite losing his throne, the kingpin walked out with an air of authority, seemingly unaffected by the ordeal. The next case shows a naive dealer caught in an unfortunate mess. On February 17, 2014, a 29-year-old victim, Kristen Kutu, was found unresponsive in her mother's car. The Cranston police showed up at the location, Hubbard Street, near Farmington Avenue in Rhode Island. The medical reports showed that she had taken with a heavy painkiller, fentanyl. The fentanyl was almost pure, causing the deadly reaction. Later, it was revealed that had been sold to Kutu by 25-year-old Aaron Andrade. The matter was taken to court, where Andrade was brought with multiple charges on him, possession of a controlled substance with the intent to deliver delivery of a controlled substance and murder. The actions that I did that day, I never meant to hurt nobody. And, and I know I hurt a lot of people, including her family and my family, because we're all going through this. A year later, the sentencing was brought into the spotlight. Andrade's body language suggests that he is trying to convey a sense of shame or remorse, perhaps as a form of social or legal expectation. However, his fleeting glances and overall demeanor do imply that his display of shame is insincere and somewhat superficial. However, Andrade still pleaded not guilty in front of the judge when the court proceedings had started. He was hopeful that a reduced sentence might be in his fate. But when the proceedings started, things did not look good for him. Kutu had struggled with addiction and also had bipolar disorder. Her first experience taking heroin was because of her boyfriend, who was a veteran, struggling with post-traumatic disorder. However, she had opted for treatment at a facility in Texas. She was supposed to attend an AA meeting, but the addiction took the better part of her, and she called Andrade. The convict sold her diesel, which is also known as D, and she lost her life just two days after she came out of her treatment. Reports say that Andrade showed signs of remorse and guilt when the sentence was being carried out. His actions held consequences, and he was ready to accept them. Andrade was sent to jail for 40 years, with 20 to serve and the rest of the sentence suspended. 
This marked the first instance in Rhode Island where a dealer was convicted of murder in relation to an overdose death. Oh, and did we mention that Andrade is the brother of alleged gang member Justice Andrade, 23, who was sentenced to two consecutive life sentences plus three years in prison for the shooting death of Tyshawn Perry in 2014. The next case is of a dealer whose only aim was expanding his enterprise, no matter the consequences. The 35-year-old Charles Rome Crosty had moved to New Richmond from Cincinnati. He had a pretty strong criminal record dating back to when he was just 14 years old. When he got out of prison, it took him four months to set up his enterprise in New Richmond. But this time, he was not going to get out of prison anytime soon. When his name popped up in the investigation for distributing him in the city, the police paid him a visit and arrested him from the 2800 block of River Road near Saddamsville. Agents from the Clermont County Narcotics Task Force, in collaboration with the Cincinnati Police Gang Squad, apprehended him in Cincinnati. He was found in possession of 25 grams of and 20 grams of Investigators suspected that the drugs were intended for distribution in New Richmond. The authorities confiscated valued at $3,750 and crack valued at $1,700. He was taken to the Clermont County Jail. Although the community had made some success in combating related issues, Rome, who held a position akin to a small town kingpin, had opened the gates for an increase in OD runs deaths. The city used to witness a couple of deaths each day when Crosty was in his prime. Crosty's main weapon was laced with fentanyl. Crosty used to have a network of addicts whom he used to spread his all around the country. If any addict did not comply with his orders, he would use intimidation and beatings to get the job done. Moreover, the prosecution claimed that he used to sell in the presence of juveniles. Plus, he used the vulnerability of the addicts in his favor. Chief Harvey had asked multiple addicts to come to the limelight and testify against Crosty. But having been beaten up before, they chose to remain quiet and did not come forward for the case. Many of them had swollen faces and black eyes. Most of them had to stay up many nights to sell the where and how Crosti demanded. This dealer had set his eyes on the money and did not care how he distributed it, which is probably why many of the witnesses did not come forward. That's the horrifying thing about this dealer. Not the amount of sold, but the locations that his ring had encompassed. As the judge was giving his sentence, he stared back in vulnerability with his eyes holding back tears. He probably had a bit of remorse over how the whole case unfolded before him. Was it remorse for his actions or remorse for being caught? Regardless, Crosty was sent to prison for 20 years and nine months with multiple charges on him, 11 counts of trafficking and one count of engaging in a pattern of corrupt activity. Even after he is free from jail, he will be on a post-control release. It is one thing to use strangers to distribute. But what if it is a family business? In 2021, the police suspected the presence of a trap house on Jacksonville East Side. They raided the house and found two lords selling and dealing heavy amounts of drugs on the site. The leaders were brothers and had been leaders of the Ring 1200, which was a subset of the Out East Gang. The two brothers, 32-year-old Rashad Johnson and 35-year-old Marquez Johnson, had spent three years in Florida prison, but that was probably not big enough a sentence because they struck harder in the drug industry as soon as they got the chance. Their conflicts with other local gangs resulted in numerous shootings, fatalities, and various related offenses in the Jacksonville area. But their main source of illegal income was their network. That's why the bus by the police crushed their dreams of expansion and brought them straight to court. 
There were multiple counts on the brothers. Trafficking, possession, and even conspiracy charges. When the Johnson brothers came before the judge, they pleaded guilty but asked for leniency in their sentences. As it counts one, three, four, five, and six, you're adjudicated guilty, sentenced to 30 years for the state prison, with 581 days credit. After the brothers, the relatives of the brothers also came forward, hoping for the same cause. They came one by one to present their testimonies in favor of the brothers before the judge. It was probably an emotional strategy played out by the lawyers, but it did not work in their favor, obviously. The prosecutor played a strong defense in which she claimed that the brothers had multiple chances to better their lives. Instead, the lives of hundreds of people were severely ruined. As the judge gives them the sentence, the brothers can be seen leaving and waving hands to the family members. They might have already given up hope when they pleaded guilty and asked for leniency. Both of them were charged with a 30-year sentence in prison. The next case is a bit interesting as it evoked a dramatic response from the convict. Check it out. Our next convict, 25-year-old Zaire Duffy, was already sought on a separate warrant for aggravated robbery when law enforcement officers saw him during their routine patrol in Lorraine County. Sensing the presence of the police, Duffy initiated a high-speed car chase on the road. Driving recklessly, he rammed into a patrol car to try and evade the situation. Duffy got out and ran for a mile in the east. However, the cops eventually pinned him down and arrested him. Duffy had given drugs and cash to hide to a woman who came up during the investigation. It was 155 GMs of a mixture containing fentanyl and a fentanyl compound. He had also been carrying a firearm, the Ruger SR-40 pistol. Duffy's previous criminal record dated back five years, with eight cases having been brought up in the courtroom before. However, his addiction to dealing brought him in front of the same judge once again as he violated his patrol. Duffy came into court and pleaded guilty in front of the judge. Uh, Mr. Duffy was unsuccessfully terminated from the CBCF for allegedly destroying uh, some toilets that closed down those bathrooms for several days for repair. A probable cause hearing was had because of those violations and Mr. Duffy was continued on community control. This proceeding was probably not the best one for him. The court had a full binder prepared on how many violations he had done and how badly his defense would have to argue in favor of him. Duffy was not just involved in dealing, but also domestic violence and many violent incidents. Duffy's lawyer is evidently feeling nervous and is trying to make himself look presentable. He understands the potentially negative impression Duffy's actions may have. The prosecutor rested her case and urged the court to impose the maximum sentence upon him. She presented additional allegations, detailing his involvement in domestic violence, citing clear bruises on his wife's body as evidence of his violent behavior. Seeing how it is panning out for him, Duffy decides to play a dramatic performance in an attempt to get out of a big sentence. I was doing good, Your Honor. I really was. I, I was doing good. However, his fake tears are transparent to those present in the room. Likewise, the lawyer stands with a blank expression, seemingly trying to comprehend the situation or wanting a desperate escape from the situation. He appears as though he is distancing himself from his client and eager to leave the courtroom. However, the judge had enough of Duffy's performance. He regrets not having given a longer sentence before and hands the convict 22.5 years in prison. Duffy did not have a good record, but it is nothing compared with the next one on our list. Joaquin El Chapo Guzman is a name many who watch headlines are familiar with. He was all over the news when he was handed by the Mexican police to the United States. He managed to evade Mexican authorities twice by orchestrating daring escapes from high security prisons. His escapes had been the talk of the town. Once, he dug a tunnel from prison which led to a house situated at a distance. 
but the beauty of it was that the house was only made to look like a construction site hiding El Chapo in plain sight. The house was designed beautifully and it had everything to accommodate the Lord. From light to a bike for his potential escape, his escape plan was fearlessly elaborate. The grandeur of his escape showed the power and the resources he had inside Mexico. The funny thing was that the country was split into two halves, where one half liked Lord and the other one hated him. But it does not change the fact that he imported illegal drugs into the United States and possibly harmed hundreds of lives. About 200 tons of coke had been brought by El Chapo into the US, having the country's whole police department after him for years. This time, the Drug Enforcement Administration brought him down from the plane under full security to secure the premises around and prevent any potential escape. El Chapo was taken to a federal courthouse in Brooklyn for his trial, where a majority of security measures were taken. All of it was done because the authorities knew how incredibly resourceful El Chapo was. The jury took five days to give the final verdict, which raised suspicions from people all around about how it feared El Chap enforcing the delay. But the court did a great job at hiding the identities of the witnesses which is a risk in such cases. There were about 50 witnesses who came forward with their testimonies against the Lord. As for El Chapo's actions that brought him guilty to the 10 counts, there is too much history. The Lord's distribution network runs back to years back. He was the one who came up with the idea of transporting in Jalapeno cans. Not to mention, he did not use the traditional road routes to deliver the illegal he employed fleets of boats to bring the drugs from Mexico into the United States. Eventually, El Chapo was charged guilty to 10 counts in federal prison. He now faces a life sentence in prison without parole. However, the authorities fear that the network produced by El Chapo is so huge that other members and the ones influenced by El Chapo remain hidden. Our last dealer for today is Zachary Wester, a police officer who did more than just deal. In a body cam footage presented in the court, Wester can be seen accusing someone else of possessing drugs in the vehicle. However, later reports and investigations revealed that the officer used to run various traffic stops and randomly planted drugs in dozens of vehicles. Many of the drivers used to get falsely accused and then arrested for the possession of controlled substances. His motive remains unclear. But one question remains the loudest as a police officer. What connections did he have to get his hands on so many? However, a large number of random arrests raised suspicion in the police department, after which he was suspended in 2018. In 2021, his case was brought to the court for further proceedings. Wester pleaded not guilty to all charges. He maintained a confident and unbothered demeanor during the trial, which looks like an attempt to pass himself off as an innocent person. The prosecutor presents his defense for the case, but you can see Wester scoffing at the statements, dismissing the prosecutor's arguments with a hard expression on his face. The prosecution then submits this footage during the court's proceedings. There was a convicted felon named Stephen Van, who had gotten out of jail just recently when Wester pulled him over at a traffic stop. The cops ran a search on his vehicle when Wester randomly implanted meth in his car. The body cam shows Van crying out and pleading that he is innocent. However, he was placed under arrest. But during Wester's trial, many alleged suspects came forward with their testimonies against the ex-cop. Van admitted to giving permission to Wester for the vehicle search, as he knew he was innocent. Van's recording was one of the few ones that the prosecution got a hold of, but there was a lot of footage that could never see the day of the light, because they mysteriously went missing. The court recording showed Wester denying with a blank expression on his face about any of this fiasco. However, you can see in the recording that Wester has a small 
package hidden inside the palm of his hands as he proceeds to put his gloves on. But of the many recordings that were brought by the prosecution, one of them had hit the jackpot. It was when Wester was running a search on Teresa Odom's vehicle. She gave him the consent to do the search since she was also innocent like many others. Later, Odom's testimony confirms that she had hidden no inside her car. Wester still denied any association with the The jury eventually came with a verdict and found him guilty of 19 charges. Wester shows no sign of remorse as he listens to the charges against him. Wester was charged with multiple counts, 67 counts of racketeering, fabricating evidence, false imprisonment, and possession of controlled substances. He was sent to state prison for 12 and a half years. That's all on lords reacting to prison sentences in the court. Let us know in the comments. What do you think about all these court proceedings? If you liked the video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel.